Hello, my name is Brad Ladwig and welcome to this presentation on photoresponsive gas separation membranes. Photoresponsive membranes are any membranes that change their separation characteristics in response to an external stimulus. And in fact, responsive membranes are all around us. They are very, very common. And that includes cell membranes. Responsive membranes could find many applications in industry. But when we look for ways to exploit the unique and interesting properties of responsive membranes, we really have to think carefully about where they make sense to use them. Because in general, it doesn't make sense to use them to replace existing membranes. That is, membranes where really we would want them to have their highest possible performance and maintain that performance for a long period of time. So the very large stationary static kind of applications for membranes, for example, seawater desalination uh, or gas processing, these are not really the applications that we think of for responsive membranes. We're thinking much more of novel applications like controlled release, anti-fouling membranes uh, and, and other novel applications. So uh, stimuli responsive membranes, to give a little summary of some that are available or have been developed before, have been used for a really wide range of things. And one of the most interesting applications uh, is in the biomedical field. So in this, in this domain, in this field, uh, it's often desired to deliver particular molecules, for example, drugs or anti-cancer agents, to a particular location in the body or to uh, a site where um, there's an illness. Uh, and often in the, in the human body where there is an illness, there's a change in the local conditions of pH and temperature. So often the temperature is higher and the pH is lower. It's more, more acidic. And actually that gives two useful triggers for stimuli responsive membranes where they are applied as uh, micelles or uh, encapsulating uh, a, a payload. So for example, uh, in the literature we can see where block copolymers, for example block copolymers with two blocks, a hydrophobic block and a hydrophilic block, the hydrophobic block often faces inwards to uh, interact with the hydrophobic drug or anti-cancer agent and the hydrophilic agent uh, is the out outward facing block and these have been made to uh, into uh, hydrophobic hydrophilic myocells that can be used to deliver drugs to particular locations in the body and if you look at the image there you can see that um, in the SEM these are quite small and reasonably mono dispersed in size. Uh, other applications have shown that you can put uh, these kinds of micelles, which are basically you know, a membrane encapsulating something into a sphere, into a particular location in the body, and not just use the local conditions of that part of the body to trigger the dissolution or, or faster release of the, the payload molecules. You can actually use an external trigger. And I think this is a very neat work where uh, an external field is applied, for example, uh, a changing magnetic field or a changing electrical field and that in turn triggers the release of the payload. As we talk a bit more about responsive membranes in the talk today, uh, you'll see that often it can be a direct action on the membrane that leads to the stimuli responsive nature. However, in, in, in many, many cases, it's actually an indirect action. So in this case, uh, the external stimulus is leading to localized heating at the membrane, which then triggers the increased permeability across the surface, or in this case, um, the faster engineered release of uh, the, the payload. So the, uh, an application at a bit larger scale, a more industrial scale, is to look at anti-fouling membranes. And I, uh, I chose this membrane because it's very interesting. It's to do with electric, electrically conductive membranes. So polyaniline is a very well-studied polymer that's been used in uh, many different membrane applications because it is electrically conductive. And this is an interesting application where the, um, the application of electric potential can help to defoul the membrane. So what I want to show here is that there is a very wide, uh, th th there is a full matrix that covers the different stimulus that we can apply to a membrane and the different kind of application domains. And I've listed three here, but of course there are many different applications. But what I'm trying to show is the span from very specialized applications, often at small scale and high value biomedical applications, 
And these are complex applications, especially if you ever want to um, use them commercially because of the regulatory uh, issues. Then uh, in the middle, I've, I've put uh, applications in water. Not that they are overly simplistic, but in many ways they are simpler than biomedical applications. Uh, and at the right, I've got the gas phase applications. And in, in our work, we have worked mostly with applications of photoresponsive materials in the gas phase. And so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. So this work started at Monash University with my great friend and colleague, Matt Hill, um, and our first joint PhD student, Rochelle Linden. And uh, what we showed is that you can use a photoresponsive metal organic framework. In this case, it was a fairly complex uh, interpenetrated MOF uh, to make a dynamic photoresponsive CO2 sorbent. So what that means is that you synthesize this material as a powder and you conduct uh, an adsorption isotherm using CO2 as the adsorbate and you dynamically change the conditions. You switch light on or off. And what we showed for this material is that if you um, constantly illuminate the material while you're conducting the adsorption isotherm, you get um, a lower uptake of CO2. If you have no illumination at all, you have a higher uptake of CO2. And if you dynamically switch the light on in between as you're conducting the experiment, you can get the, uh, the extent of adsorption of the adsorbate to move between those two points. It doesn't go fully to the point of the, um, the adsorption isotherm where there was no light, but it is substantially moving between the two. This was one of the first reports of this dynamic photoresponsive CO2 sorption, um, and it has uh, it led to us doing a lot more work in this area, and, and many other groups uh, around the world have, have gone on to work in this area as well. In our case, uh, again with Matt and Rochelle, uh, we showed that it's possible not just by using this type of MOF, but using other types of MOFs and other strategies. Uh, so putting in guest molecules or coating the outside of the MOF particles with different um, agents allows you to produce this kind of photoresponsive nature, either a slow photoresponse or a fast photoresponse. And it's, it, it kind of broadened the field a bit to show that it's, uh, it's possible to use different approaches to achieve a photoresponsive um, CO2 sorbent. But so far we've only been talking about photoresponsive sorbents and this is a membrane conference and I'm a membrane researcher. So we want to say, how can we go from making these porous materials into photoresponsive membranes? So uh, in 2015, I moved to the Department of Chemical Engineering at Imperial College London. Uh, and I've worked with many, many very bright uh, colleagues there, some of whom uh, are deeply involved with um, the leadership and organization of this conference. And uh, while we were there, uh, we made membranes using two uh, more recently discovered metal organic frameworks. And they are Chuck 62 And this one uh, uses a, a ligand, this azobenzene tetracarboxylic acid ligand, which as you can see, has this nitrogen-nitrogen double bond in the middle. And that's really key. This functionality uh, is used extensively in photoresponsive materials, photoresponsive chemistry more broadly, but especially in photoresponsive metal organic frameworks because it's robust, it's relatively easy to, um, to insert into these ligands, and uh, the, the uh, photoisomerization of it is very well understood. So we know that we can photoisomerize the free ligand. When we make it into a MOF, we showed uh, as far back as 2013, that you can get changes to the adsorption characteristics of the material. Um, it's still debatable about how the, 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 the three-dimensional porous structure of the material changes when you photoilluminate it, because it's constrained material. So not every bond can fully photoisomerize because then it would no longer retain its structure. But it definitely does change enough and the local adsorption conditions change enough that you have a substantial change in the gas sorption. So for this material, JUC62, um, and here I show uh, an animation of that material um, in uh, three dimensions. If you look closely, you can see those nitrogen-nitrogen double bonds and just how, uh, how widely distributed they are throughout the material. So you can see it's a strongly photoresponsive material. The uh, really interesting result 
with this material compared to our result um, with uh, the azobenzene material back in 2013, published in Angavanta Shami, this time we got the full photo response. So in the dynamic photo response experiment, we were able to go from the full static light uh, adsorption isotherm to the full no light adsorption isotherm and dynamically switch between the two. So in terms of a photoresponsive material, this is a better performing photoresponsive material and it is reasonably stable as a MOF material. So the, the very short term stability test result that we published in this paper, uh, which was published back in 2017, was that if you synthesize the MOF and leave it on the bench for two weeks, so in ambient air, some humidity, not extremes of temperature, and come back and make that same dynamic photo response measurement two weeks later, you get almost the same result. And if you look in our publication, you'll see other uh, characterization, for example, powder XRD after storing it for some time, show that it doesn't rapidly degrade. It's still not a monumentally stable material, but, um, but it's good and it's able to be produced into membranes, which was key for us. We wanted a relatively stable material that we can, for example, mix with a polymer and a solvent and it won't immediately decompose so that we can cast a membrane and have a membrane with our photoresponsive particles in there. The other material that we worked with uh, was PCN250. So this material also has that same photoresponsive ligand, which is that azobenzene tetracarboxylic acid. And uh, again, here is just a, an animation of uh, a couple of unit cells to give you an, uh, an idea of the porosity of the material, but also the widespread nature of these uh, photoresponsive groups throughout the structure. We synthesized photoresponsive membranes from these two materials, and we did that by taking the particles, mixing them up with the polymer and the solvent, and casting those membranes out and evaporating the solvent. We characterized the membranes comprehensively. You can, you can see in the publication many different uh, characterization results. What I show here, is from uh, an, a fractured surface under the SEM that the particles are well distributed. We don't have any major voids or defects. Um, and for these materials, we could go up to around 10 to 15% by weight loading uh, before we got membranes that were too brittle to be handled or tested. And the other result that I show here is the XRD spectra for the raw material, uh, for the polymer. And when you combine them in different loadings, um, that we still clearly see the peaks attributed to the, uh, the MOF particles. So that convinced us that that's quite a good confirmation that we did get the particles in there and that they are uh, dispersed. So we needed to measure these membranes in a permeation cell where we could illuminate the membranes. And to do that, we actually needed to invent uh, a new type of permeation cell that where we could easily get our light to the membrane. And uh, this was the first generation of cell that we invented like this. And what we did is we just made a conventional permeation cell. We increased the headspace above the membrane and we, you can now purchase very high performance, high intensity LEDs uh, that are very robust. Uh, so we, um, we placed one of those inside there. And so we were able to provide power to the cell, which pr provided, which produced intense a UV light relatively close to the membrane surface and we were able to illuminate our membranes that way. There were a few challenges. Uh, what you can see if you look closely is there's a, there's a heating water bath or a cooling water bath behind our membrane test cell and we had to incorporate a heat exchanger on top of the, the metal that had this LED underneath it because these high intensity LEDs as LEDs go are relatively inefficient. They're about 50% efficient uh, so that means that half of the electrical energy input is, uh, is dissipated as heat. And because we didn't want to heat our membrane, um, because that confounds the effects of the photoresponsive nature of the materials. Because of course you can change the gas permeation properties of a membrane by just changing the temperature of the membrane. And we wanted to determine what is just the change we see from the illumination. Uh, so with a heat exchanger on top we could take away the heat from the LED. Uh, but it was still challenging to keep these at, uh, at a constant temperature. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. The photo you see uh, shows one of the membranes inside the, the housing. The membranes are glued onto a metal disc and, um, and held inside there. Now, the results that we got uh, were quite interesting. 
So uh, as I said earlier, when we cast these membranes, the highest we could go to was about 15 weight percent for JUC62 and 10 weight percent for PCN250. And for those membranes, when we conduct uh, repeated on-off um, CO2 permeation tests, so it's a single gas permeation test to measure the CO2 permeability, we saw a consistent and statistically significant reduction in the CO2 permeability when we had the light turned on. And that's what you would expect because when you measure the gas absorption of these materials, when you illuminate them with, with UV light, they spontaneously desorb a lot of their adsorbed CO2, up to 40 or 50%. So we know that these materials do not um, adsorb CO2 well when they are illuminated. And uh, so we expect that when we put them in a membrane, they will not trans transport or permeate CO2 well when they are illuminated. Um, we did the, the study quite carefully. So we did repeated on off measurements to show that it was a, a dynamic or reversible effect. Uh, and we also did some control studies. So we did studies with just plain membrane, uh, matrimid membrane with no inorganic filler in there um, and subjected it to the light cycling and showed that there was no effect. And we also made uh, nanocomposite membranes with matrimid and ZIF8. So ZIF8 um, has been studied very widely as a filler particle in mixed matrix membranes and we put it in there to show that if we put a material that we know uh, that is not photoresponsive because we've measured actually the the performance of ZIF8 as a photoresponsive sorbent and showed that it's it's negligible any changes in its gas sorption properties when it's illuminated we showed that it, it, it as a good control membrane that you do not observe this kind of photoresponsive nature when you have the same polymer but a non-photoreactive filler particle. So this was an interesting result. It's one of the first results for photoresponsive mixed matrix membranes using these MOFs. Um, but uh, where did we go from there? So uh, if you read the title of this talk or the abstract for this talk carefully, you would have seen that originally this talk was supposed to be about AZO UIO66. Uh, so this is a fascinating material that we developed. Most of the work was done by my colleague, Nicolas Presetia, who is the co-author of this talk. And uh, that's a really interesting material because UIO66 is a very stable metal organic framework. And by ligand substitution, so taking some of the um, benzene dicarboxylate ligands and substituting it with a, uh, a ligand that has a, as a side chain um, an azobenzene group, we were able to introduce more or less photoresponsive nature into that material. And in fact, all around the world, people are developing new metal organic frameworks, new porous materials that do not contain metals, covalent organic frameworks, porous polymers. There are many new classes of materials and an inordinately large number of examples. So there is no shortage of new materials uh, for us to work with. Um, but I want to talk to you now about where we're going with this research. So what we are doing now is we are trying to develop a new test cell and that's to address two problems. When I talked about our first photoresponsive membrane test cell, I said we had to get the heat away from the top of the cell where we had this LED light. So we've eliminated that problem uh, by producing our light externally and using an optical fiber to bring it into the cell. Uh, the engineering of the top part of the cell has to be done quite carefully so that you get a gas tight seal and so that the optics are correct. So the distance from the end of the fiber to the top of the membrane has to be calculated carefully so that you're not sort of wasting your light, but you're covering the whole membrane surface. So we think we've dealt with the top part of the problem, taking the heat away and just having like cool light coming in to illuminate the top of the membrane. But we still have this challenge that our membranes absorb the light and not all of that absorbed energy goes into this azobenzene photoisomerization. Some of it is just conventionally absorbed and converted to heat. And we want to get rid of that heat because ideally when we make these measurements, we want the membrane to be at exactly the same temperature, whether it's illuminated or not so that we can determine if the phenomena that we observe is really truly related to the photo response in the porous materials. So to deal with that, what we've done is when you see uh, that uh, two pieces of our membrane cell, we're going to separate that and insert in there a third piece, which is a metal 3D printed heat exchanger. And uh, if you look in the, the short video here, you will see that inside that heat exchanger, we have um, a metal grid, and you don't actually see it completely at the moment because we will print this on a 3D printer and there's actually some sacrificial material included in the design. So after it has been printed, 
we need to put that in a lathe and machine back um, one face of it so that you can see the, um, the pores that, that the membrane will sit on and allow the permeate to go through the membrane. But when we look back through one side, you can see inside there that we actually have created channels through which we will pump cooling water uh, or, or heating water, whatever we, we need to maintain the surface temperature of the metal grid that the membrane is sitting on at exactly the right level to maintain the surface temperature of our membrane. So this is under construction right now in the Institute for Microprocess Engineering where I work in Karlsruhe. Uh, we have two uh, very impressive 3D metal printers, one selective laser melting printer and a binder, jet printing, binder jetting printer. So two different technologies available for printing. This piece itself has been designed to go in the selective laser melting printer uh, and that required that it had some unique features um, to avoid overhangs. And I can talk to you more about that uh, if you like. So that's our next step. We are creating this new generation of photoresponsive membrane cell for our testing and we're going to make the design uh, open. So once we've tested it and validated it and shown that it works, um, we, will, we will publish that and, and make the design freely available for anyone else that would like to manufacture a, a membrane cell the same as us. We are working very hard on new membrane architectures uh, with my colleagues at KIT. Um, they are producing these SIRMOF membranes and I can talk to you more about that if, if you're interested. And uh, we are planning to create a new generation of polymer membranes that have a, a structure that's more analogous to inorganic supported membranes. And again, if you're interested in that, I'm happy to talk to you further. What's really exciting, this is the next big step for us uh, with membrane testing and characterization. And that is to incorporate AI or machine learning with membrane testing. So I've shown here very simply what we are aiming to do in the coming years. That is to, in the center, we have our membrane test stand. And that is going to be a fully automated test stand that allows us to load in a membrane and then without any human input, uh, adjust the testing temperature, the testing pressure, and especially the testing feed composition, whether that's single gas or mixed gas, uh, we, exp we wanna make the whole thing fully automated. And there's two reasons for that. One, we want to be able to run very extended testing regimes, so load in a membrane and test it for a very long period of time in a range of different conditions. But the second and much more important aspect is that we want to couple this to machine learning. So what we will do is test our membranes, deposit the data into uh, an electronic lab notebook and repository, and that's uh, a unique feature at KIT that I'm happy to talk to you about further. There's a reference at the bottom of the slide. But what's really neat is that you don't need to test every single combination of gases at every temperature and every pressure to get a full picture of the performance of a membrane. And in fact, we can test just some of them and use smart machine learning models to fill in some of the gaps. So there's a paper published on this very recently by Kim Gels and Aaron Thornton and other colleagues that was a brilliant piece of work and it really inspired us to build this new type of system, this hardware in the loop system that seamlessly blends together membrane testing with a, a very smart uh, data storage system that's open and accessible and uh, machine learning. So the machine learning should then go back and tell the membrane test stand what temperature should you make the next measurement at? What pressure should you take the next measurement at? Uh, and that then builds into a bigger picture, which is that we want to move away from this traditional way of making membranes, which is that one group in one university or in one company says we want to develop a new membrane that's good for this particular separation. And we make our materials and we test them on that separation and then maybe we publish it or maybe we don't, or maybe we publish it but it's just some static figures in a, or a table and there's no open data. We want to stop that. We want to go to the point where we have uh, membranes that we make and that we characterize and we deposit all of the data, the good performance data and the bad performance data at a range of different temperatures and pressures and feed compositions into an open database so that we can use a machine learning model on our data to guide where we test those membranes further. And actually it's quite possible to use a membrane learning, uh, a, a machine learning model to give you ideas on where to look to make changes to the materials. But that's a different topic. 
Uh, this whole system, we're going to try as much as possible to build it with um, open hardware and open software. So what that means is hardware with open published interfaces so that it can be easily controlled uh, and open software, which is software that we will write to control it um, and we will host that on public repositories. Finally, we are truly and fully committed to making our data fair. That means findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And there are very good reasons for that and that's what I want to, to finish with today. So this vision is that membranes will still be developed by real scientists. We, we aren't using robots to make membranes because actually I, I think that's too complex at the moment. But what we want is that the data that we get from testing these membranes goes into open repositories. We will start doing it with, with all of our data but we want to make the approach completely open so that anyone could adopt it. And ideally, many will, and we will have databases of open membrane characterization data all around the world. Doesn't mean there will be one master database that everyone puts their stuff into, but everyone's databases should be easily accessible, interoperable, and the data should be reusable. It's very good thing especially if you talk to the colleagues that work in AI and machine learning research, if they can have access to lots of high quality data. And that's good for them in developing their machine learning models, but it's actually good for us as membrane scientists and membrane engineers as well, when we want to develop our next generation membranes, that we have access to a lot of data and data that's easily compared and can be compared by, by machines and not just by us reading a lot of papers um, in, in the traditional way. So in summary, what I've talked about is that we've worked on photoresponsive materials, we've made photoresponsive membranes, and in future we will make more of these membranes. Uh, the new developments that we're very excited about and we're pursuing are to incorporate AI and machine learning with membrane testing uh, to create this kind of hardware in the loop model. And as part of that, we want to launch this AI supported open membrane data initiative. So, and we're going to lead by example. We're going to build the hardware and make the designs available. We're going to write the software and make that available through open repositories. And we're going to, we already have at KIT an exceptionally good uh, repository for research data called Keymotion. And we will build on that for this membrane data initiative. So I think the future is open. It's about having open hardware, open software, open testing approaches that we don't keep inside. We don't keep it secret at, uh, until we've published and we only publish the best results and keep the other 90% hidden. We actually want to publish all our data, all our results and make it available to everyone and lead by example by making our data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation today. Very happy to take your questions now in this session, but perhaps even more importantly, please do get in touch with me. Uh, if you are interested in our materials research, and especially if you're interested in participating in this initiative to uh, have this open membrane data initiative supported by AI. Thank you very much.